All right, so we're gonna kick off uh, our, our next panel. And this is gonna be led by uh, the great Lewis Krauss, the co-director for the uh, Pacific ADA Center. It will focus on inclusive sheltering operations. It's all about integrating the whole community. But this is gonna be dynamic. So Lewis, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And uh, thank you in advance, this is gonna be great. Thanks so much, Vance, and thank you um, to all the organizers here of this AFN symposium. I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is kind of a dream that, that I have had for a long time. I'm really glad to see that you guys got made it come to fruition. It's very exciting. Um, so welcome all of you to day two of the National Access and Functional Needs Symposium. Uh, this panel is on inclusive sheltering operations, integrating the whole community. So as Van said, I'm Lewis Krauss. I'm the co-director of the Pacific ADA Center, one of 10 regional centers and one coordinating center across the country that provide information and trainings on the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, some of you may know me from the ADA National Network's Emergency Management and Inclusion of People with Disabilities webinars, um, and that we've been doing for about 10 years now. If you don't know that series, it provides monthly webinars on topics for inclusive emergency management, and you can sign up to um, see those and, and see uh, even the archives um, at adapresentations.org. There's about 10 years worth of um, um, uh, webinars that are there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I started my journey in this inclusive emergency management world after the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Um, we heard a report from disability advocates about, um, about what happened to people with disabilities in the evacuation from that event. Um, in particular, stories of the shelter that was set up in the New, or New Orleans Superdome, maybe you all remember those. Those stories were pretty dramatic and the, the, those stories really supercharged people's efforts in emergency management and preparedness for people with disabilities to improve things um, and in, especially including sheltering um, as the Superdome was showed all sorts of um, issues, um, especially physical access, communications access, service animal issues, personal assistance issues and more. Um, Fast forward from that about a decade, <clears throat> and during a, a meeting our sponsor, our center sponsored in California to talk with emergency managers about the needs of people with disabilities in emergencies, we heard the story of a woman who was being evacuated from her house due to, uh, to a shelter due to an immediate danger to her home and nearby area. As she was a woman in a wheelchair and had some specific needs, um, she <clears throat> couldn't go in normal uh, transportation and need to be taken by an ambulance to the shelter, where once she got there, she talked to the shelter and looked around and realized that that shelter was not going to have and did not have the resources that she was going to need to survive there. So against everyone's better judgment, but her, her decision, she asked them to take her back into the evacuation zone to her house because at least she could really survive there. So these shelter stories are dramatic and really have informed the field over the years to not let these issues happen again. Um, but they also show that shelters, they're really based on trust, right? And, and this woman's trust, if people don't believe that the shelter will meet their needs, they're going to stay home. So given that as our background, our introduction to the issue of shelters, let's meet our panelists who are gonna lead us through their vast experiences to understand how to plan for and operate successful shelters that are inclusive. We have a great panel that um, really reflects your backgrounds, I think, um, whether you are people with disabilities or organizations representing people with disabilities, or whether you're an emergency management office or associated state or local jurisdiction, or whether you're a nonprofit that provides assistance in shelters and emergencies. 
So our panelists are Denise Everhart. Denise has been with the American Red Cross since 2013 and has been the Division Disaster Executive for the Pacific Division of the American Red Cross since 2015. We also have Jim House. Jim is the Disability Integration Manager for the Coalition on Inclusive Emergency Planning, CEIP, C, uh, sorry, CIEP at the Washington State Independent Living Council. And that's a, the CIEP is a statewide advisory group that focuses on effective communications, programmatic and physical access and other functional access needs and issues impacting people with disabilities and emergencies. We also have JR and Flavian. Uh, JR serves as the chief for the disaster services branch within the California Department of Social Services and is the lead for mass care and shelter in California. And finally, we have Travis Houston, the assistant emergency management coordinator at the city of Dallas's office of emergency management. All right, so I wanna start our discussion um, and uh, start with Denise Everhart from uh, American Red Cross. Um, Denise, yesterday in this ADA, uh, or sorry, in this AFM symposium, there was um, a session that talked about inclusive planning and collaboration. Um, maybe you can talk about um, how American Red Cross fits in with collaboration and partnership with, pe with people with disabilities for shelter planning and operations? Hey, Lewis, this is Vance. Just before Denise jumps in. Yeah. But if we could ask all of your panelists to turn their cameras on. Okay. Then we, we, can see the, we can see the entire group. This is a, a good looking group. Um, Vance, just to let you know, it says I cannot start my video because that opened it. Okay, I'm changing that right now. Let's see. Does it work? Yep. <laughs> Fantastic. Denise Lewis, I don't know if you know this, this is my disaster wife. <laughs> We've spent an incredible amount of time together in our state operations center. So uh, yes, you have to have your camera on. That's great. All right, I'm out. Thanks. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Vance. Um, my name is Denise Everhart. Uh, as Liz said, I'm, I'm the division disaster executive. Um, I wear glasses and I have reddish, brownish, grayish long hair and my background is full of Red Cross logos given to me by other people. It's a really interesting question for us and, and I'm a little bit of a storyteller by nature so you'll have to forgive me for weaving some stories in here. But really the Oroville Dam evacuation was our first in this new kind of phase of the increased disaster pace and these larger disasters that we're seeing across the country. For me and my division, that was the first one where we identified that we had a huge gap in, in helping people with disabilities, helping them prepare for disasters, helping them know to come to our shelters. There was, there was an element of fear. And the thing that we learned, and we were learning this across the country at the Red Cross, was first, we needed education. And, and Vance is you know, very close, we work very closely together and, and I've been very lucky to have a state disability integration person who can really walk me through what it means self-determination, what we need to have in place and what processes. We've continued over that course of time to refine and to include more partners and to figure out how do we identify the challenges beforehand and the processes and the trainings that we can do? So the Red Cross, we, and we were learning this across the country because there were hurricanes and other disasters happening. And we kept running into the fact that our shelters weren't perceived as welcoming. And sometimes, and it didn't matter if it was a Red Cross shelter or an independent shelter, in some ways they're all, all of our shelters. So if a shelter is not welcoming, we need to work on that as a community. You can't just work on that in a silo, like Jason said. So we really started to, to look at what do we need to do? The first thing that we did was we hired a disability integration person at our national headquarters to really help advise and inform 
And then we have them at the division level, which is my level, we're broken into six divisions. And then also at the regional level, but more importantly, was getting together with our local counties, getting together with our local tribes, getting together with our communities, with our states, with the, the federal government, and making sure we all had common mes messaging. We came down to some very simple messages that we thought would really resonate. Everyone is welcome. Um, and and that's, that's the core of our work is that everyone is welcome and we will make accommodations for your needs. We will not say the shelter cannot handle you. We will not say you have to show ID. We will not say, I wanna see paperwork on whether or not that's a service animal. We don't do any of that. What we do is we welcome people and we say, okay, this shelter, these are the services we provide. What do you need to be comfortable in this shelter? Um, and then the second thing is get to yes right? Find a way to get to yes. If we can't source a hospital bed, there's a community that can help us source a hospital bed for somebody if that's what they need. And so really trying to make that, that core, that community, I really like what Jason said. He said, no silos, never stand alone. And I think that's vitally important. And then the other thing that we learned was wrong decisions sometimes are made on the ground. Um, and what you have to have are fail safes in place beforehand to make sure that you can identify a decision and change the outcome. So at times we had people who, who the determination was the shelter can't handle them and we made a referral. Vance and I and, and JR with his FAST teams have worked out a process whereby they have to notify us. They, they don't get to make the referral. They have to notify us and we have to be able to see at this higher level, what can we do to make sure that we're not making every accommodation, that we're not going above and beyond to keep people where they want to be. Um, and, and I know we'll talk more about displacement, but that planning beforehand, starting from transportation to the messaging around shelters being accessible to plans for escalation if there is a problem to supplies, all of that has to happen at every single level. Um, we are hyper-local in the Red Cross. And so having those conversations with our the the most local level, and that's not even necessarily county government, right? It can be with our centers for independent living, with the community, really trying to get that hyper local because that's where the solutions will start. That's also where we'll see where we have challenges. Um, and, and so those are kind of where we've come over time to really understand that people with disabilities are disproportionately affected by disasters disasters are growing and the number of people with, with disabilities and the poverty level that we're seeing across the board, all of those things are compounding factors making this a priority for us. Um, and, and we have that at the Red Cross ac across all of our jurisdictions. I'm very lucky in that we've been able to take some of the partnerships that we've had with the FEMA regions, the state of California, with Vance, with, with CDSS, and really kind of look at some of those successes and export them. Um, if you wanna to talk to some people who figured out how, how a state can really be partners to everybody, California is, is really a model for the right way to do things. And we're just really happy to be part of this symposium and part of this panel. Great, thank you. Um, all right, well, let's, uh, now that you raised this issue of collaboration, I, I wanna turn now to Jim, Jim House. Um, Jim, we know about the importance of including people with disabilities in planning and in all steps of emergency planning. Um, can you share how the disability community has been included in shelter planning and operations in Washington, you could even maybe touch on that um, uh, the the effort that Jason referred to about the Cascadia um, effort. Um, can you can you share with that with us? Sure, no problem. 
I just want to make sure that the interpreter, everything is going to work out. Everyone can hear the interpreter okay. Seeing no problem, I'm going to move on. CIEP, um, statewide uh, advisory group under Washington State and their independent living center, centers and council. We've had monthly calls on Zoom, um, averaging probably 25 to 30 people per meeting to talk about all of those things um, that we've been talking about. So last June, during our monthly meeting, we had a Cascadia Rising 2022, where we're supposed to cover um, a training based on a 2016 thing that had happened. In 2016, we didn't know anything about access and functional needs or anything. So this year, our goal was to really put emphasis on training for those kinds of needs for everywhere within um, operations. But unfortunately, COVID came around. And so we had a lot of high turnover in the emergency management team. So we had to go back to just having a tabletop discussion about it. Based on things that we've seen, for example, in uh, the Hawaii volcanoes back in 2018, um, there's been rumors that a lot of the deaf people uh, had to go out of the shelter, escape the shelters to go back home, not understanding the danger of the gases in that area. And so we had to make a lot of calls on video phone, but of course there wasn't any service. Um, in the shelters themselves for people to use that. So we don't want people to be put in danger again. So that's where we started thinking about all the other examples. And also um, CIEP, my group, has its own AFN, tabletop um, emergency practice talking about responses to disasters and the chaos that ensues. So since then, we've been having uh, some small things like fires, flooding, uh, with, that have called for the Red Cross and other emergency, mag emergency management teams to address some of the issues and some of the gaps within the access and functional needs and to see how our requests for services and our experts uh, have grown in the last six years, plus during COVID and all the other things that have happened. Uh, let me just review some things here. That's pretty much it um, for now. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Jim. All right. Um, now we'll move on to Travis. Um, Travis, in, in thinking about how a local jurisdiction like Dallas, where you are, plans for inclusive shelters, um, I understand you had a fire recently at a senior living facility that kind of informed your agency's planning for needs for people with disabilities going forward. Maybe we can use that as kind of a model here for to help people understand how to, how to think about uh, planning. Sure, thank you. Um, again, good morning, everybody. My name is Travis Houston, uh, Assistant Emergency Management Coordinator for City of Dallas. Uh, you see him pronouns, uh, I'm in a purple shirt, blonde hair. Um, thanks for having me here today and allowing me to step in for, for Rock Yard Director. Unfortunately, um, it wasn't able to make it today. So, um, yeah, so actually, you know, just a, a couple of months ago, we had a, an apartment fire 
at a senior living facility. It, it wasn't um, an assisted living facility, but it was all individuals 65 and older, and it completely destroyed uh, about 50 units. And uh, we quickly realized that most everyone involved in this had some level of, of access or functional need. And that was, while it, it's not new for us to uh, make those accommodations and be prepared to, to include that as part of our plans and, and, and have those accommodations in our shelter, it was new for us to have that be at near 100% of the shelter population. Um, and so really our, our solution there, um, I, I think has helped us as we look forward to our, to our future events. And it was really just getting the right partners involved. Um, fortunately, we had made a lot of those relationships through COVID, um, different, working with different hospitals and different advocacy groups that we were able to call on that we may not have anticipated having the need to use before, um, but then did. And this was everything from uh, durable medical equipment to prescription assistance to, to all of those things that, that would be a component of any shelter. But in this situation, it, it was um, magnified. Um, it, it also presented a, a bit of a, a, a challenge in that um, we had began, we, we had begun the process of transitioning from uh, doing virtually all non-congregate sheltering throughout COVID um, and have been sort of trying to move back to, to more of a congregate shelter model, um, especially as uh, Red Cross and other organizations have sort of started doing that as well. So, so we've been making that move and you know, within the first hour of that event, it was clear to everybody that that just was not going to work for this situation. And, and so instead of, instead of separating folks or anything like that, we just made the decision that we're going to go to a non-congregate model for this event for everybody. Let's just go to the same place. So everybody's getting the same services at the same time. Um, and I think that was a really critical move and, you know, not only kept, uh, allowed for folks to, to be able to be comfortable and and be and have you know access to accessible shelter, but also kept that community together, um, which I think was a really critical piece of that uh, in in their recovery um, was not having folks split up, uh, and so that event really taught us a lot um, and uh, allowed us to sort of look at the some of the finer details of our plans that and and some of our planning assumptions maybe um, because we had an immediate need. To, to look at that for, for a larger number of people than, than we maybe have ever had for a localized emergency. Great, and, and that's actually a, a, a very important point here about the, the shelters and being um, the, the idea of general shelters versus special needs shelters. And we know and have known, um, and all of you should should be aware that special needs shelters is not really the model that we want to go to. You know, we've learned that that can be problematic, can be problematic because, for example, let me give you one example. If you had, and, and we learned this years ago, if you had special needs shelters on one side of town and you had a general shelter on the other side of town and the emergency happens, whatever the disaster happens, whatever it is, let's say, for example, a flood, and it happens to go right down one part of the, the city or the jurisdiction, and now if you were at a general shelter and you lived on the other side or you needed to go to the special needs shelter, you couldn't get there. But now that general shelter doesn't have the, the services and the, the, it isn't planned for in the way that you would need. So this is not a useful concept. So really, the move to making all general shelters, you know, have all of the planning needed for all people is really the model that that has made some sense for a long time. So, JR, let's turn to you now. Um, California has been a, a leader in making shelters and other emergency management operations inclusive. Um, for example, you use these uh, community assistance um, like the functional assessment uh, services teams or FAST teams. Maybe you can explain a little bit about those and how they're used for shelters and maybe some people who aren't familiar with it can learn about that. Yes, thank you very much, Lewis. Um, and thank you, Vance, as well, for having me here today. My name again is uh, J.R.N. Tablian. I'm the chief of the disaster services branch at the California Department of Social Services. 
Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I'm wearing a white shirt and blue tie, and I have uh, brown hair. Um, so yes, the FAST teams are actually one of our um, two sets of teams that we have that we deploy to shelters um, during disasters upon request from local jurisdictions. So we have the VEST, the volunteer emergency services teams, and we have our FAST teams, which is our which are our functional assessment service teams. So the FAST teams, um, we first uh, work with all local jurisdictions to set FAST teams up. So we we have a set of what we call our quarterly meetings with all of the mass care and shelter uh, leads throughout the state. And then we meet with them to discuss um, various issues. One of those is FAST. We have a standing, our FAST coordinator has a standing update that provides updates to um, the counties when it comes to FAST. <clears throat> what we try to do is, well, we try to build our, um, our cadre of FAST members from the state that can deploy anywhere throughout the state to shelters. We also work with local jurisdictions because it's extremely important that when a disaster strikes, the local jurisdictions are the first ones that are going to be there to set up these shelters and respond to a disaster. Um, so what we've done is uh, in creating these FAST teams for the state, we've also partnered with all of um, the counties and NGOs, we also partner with the American Red Cross, Denise's team, um, to provide these trainings um, to anybody that wants them throughout the state. So uh, the members, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the counties throughout the state that want to build their own FAST team would just reach out. We provide the trainings virtually. Um, but these members would go into a shelter, take a look um, and see if there are any folks that maybe have access and functional needs work with them to identify any needs or anything they may um, have, even when it comes to, uh, for example, a, a cot. I mean, we, we help provide cots to um, any jurisdiction that needs it during a disaster, but understanding what we have is the job of the FAST team. Um, so we also have AFN cots. Those cots, um, are used for people with those access and functional needs that provide that additional support, whether they're bariatric, whether they're higher off the ground. It's that that ability to have this FAST team come in and do this assessment to understand what the need is. Maybe it's um, helping with coordination for medical, um, meaning uh, prescriptions. And while a FAST team member can't actually write a prescription, they can at least coordinate with some of the medical staff on the ground in the shelter um, or the local jurisdictions, public health, to try and coordinate and get those prescriptions for uh, the person. So I will say, while I have this opportunity, any jurisdiction that wants, um, whether that's county, whether that's uh, a tribe, and whether that's another state, we've actually had other states reach out to us in the past to ask, um, can we provide them some of our materials for FAST, um, our information, our brochures. We're more than happy to work with any jurisdiction. Um, throughout the country and even beyond uh, that wants to help set up their own FAST teams. I can talk about FAST probably for the next three hours because it is something that is near and dear to my heart. So um, I don't want to go too much into it, uh, but uh, I will offer anybody that wants help in setting up a FAST team or anybody that may just have questions, additional questions about FAST, uh, please reach out to me directly. I'm more than happy to provide that. And I believe uh, Vance is going to provide contact information at the end. Yeah, thanks, JR. And, and I, I, I want to put a little bit of an emphasis on this because I think that, that, that the FAST teams really sort of give that um, knowledge, that local knowledge, that, that um, lived experience, as it were, you know, um, uh, to um, the, the teams trying to set up these shelters to sort of give them some specifics that people may or may not need, may or may not know ahead of time in setting up the shelter. So it's a really, it's a really useful uh, concept that, that was, you know, originally started by um, June Kales way back uh, a long time ago and, and, and California really adopted it and took it on. But also, um, Washington took it on Jim Jim House and so Jim do you want to talk about how how you guys uh, are doing that with the uh, fast teams? Yes. Um In Tacoma, Washington we have set up a fast team who have taken training 
who have done a lot of learning, um, have done one-on-one -on -one trainings and working with each of the individuals and doing research for their accessible needs. But let me back up at first, I'm sorry, I kind of jumped ahead, um, but I wanted to describe myself to people who are joining. I am a white male with dark brown hair, a little bit of gray in there. I have glasses and I'm in my home office reaching out to you from here. Um, now, going back uh, to what I was talking about, I wanted to explain about our relationship with the American Red Cross. We have, they have us on a speed dial for sure. Um, anytime there is accessible functioning needs uh, that need to be set up within a shelter, they have their own disability grassroots staff that meet different AFN needs. But once in a while, sometimes they are stuck in a hard place and so they will contact us. Um, maybe someone has lost their home was in a fire, um, maybe they have a mental disability, cognitive disability. So they'll contact us to help um, with the local council for independent living and connect with the people within those shelters to help them find a temporary or permanent long-term housing. Some people have lost their wheelchairs in fires um, and try, so we try to find and help them find a replacement wheelchair. Um, so American Red Cross does contact us maybe two or three years. We had the bad fires in the state, uh, central and east Was eastern Washington. We had those bad fires. We had flooding. We found one shelter that was not belonging to the Red Cross. It was actually set up by a church. Um, they did not have any ADA showers, accessible showers for people. So we found that out uh, and some of our partners in, in the CIL were calling around and found, were able to find a shower for the shelter that was accessible. This was in Northern Washington. So those things that people see are very valuable. Uh, our expertise in these areas are very valuable because we have spent a lot of time and many people actually don't know where to go in a situation, emergency situation. And, you know, we do know where things are and we need to use those resources that are there for us for accessible functional needs, uh, medical equipment and other types of equipment as well. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, so let's go back now in, in sort of reverse order here and come back to JR and um, JR, your um, California also has a support document on sheltering that people um, should be aware of. Can you can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so in 2020, we noticed when the pandemics um, had the onset that we were going to have to drastically change our approach uh, to sheltering. Um, normally, shelters are in a congregate type setting, whether that be um, a high school gymnasium. Uh, whether that be uh, classrooms turned into um, just big open spaces. Uh, we saw with the pandemic that that was going to be problematic because if one person had COVID um, or communicable disease, then all people within that shelter could have a communicable disease. Um, so we really had to work with our partners to figure out uh, what do we do? What kind of guidance do we provide to the counties and local jurisdictions on sheltering? Um, so we worked to put a work group together with our state partners, um, other local jurisdictions that we that we identified, NGOs like the American Red Cross, and more importantly, um, Vance's team. We we really don't want to create anything that talks about sheltering without thinking of access and functional needs. Um, and I know we went back and forth with Vance's team to make sure that we really had everything that we could think of. Uh, and even then, once we we I created this plan on uh, making guidance or suggestions on how to shelter people during a pandemic using non congregate shelters like uh, hotels or motels or possibly dorm rooms. We then, as we executed this plan, we found that there are more things that can come because you can't really send a fast member to each hotel room. That's gonna be very difficult. Um, and identifying the needs of people that 
may have a harder time communicating those needs. So as we develop a plan, we continually uh, made updates or adopted new policies. I know Vance's team was instrumental in helping us with language access. We tried to communicate with everybody within a hotel room. Um, and so we had Vance's team work on translating those letters into multiple languages to slide under the door. We created surveys to ensure that anybody that needed food or if there were maybe medical needs, um, prescriptions or anything, people had the ability to let us know so that we could try and go to those rooms. So it's not just thinking about what what can we do for people in shelters, but then I having that idea of okay, now that we're implementing this plan, what are we seeing are the gaps? What are the concerns while we're implementing this plan? Because you can only think of everything. You, you can't think of the unknown. And that was that was our issue is what are we missing? Um, and the great part of that is Vance and his team, the American Red Cross, our state partners. We really tried to adapt these plans instantly as we found that, okay, there's could be some issues. So while we not only created this plan, we called, um, we, we sent it distributed to all emergency managers, all mass care. Um, but then we also did a walkthrough. Um, my team and I hosted a meeting for all of the mass care, which are the lead in California for housing um, people during disasters. And we wanted to walk through the plan page by page and make sure that one, people understood what the recommendations were. Um, because again, the local jurisdictions, they're the ones that are going to house people immediately. The first 24, 72 hours, I mean, they're the ones that are housing people through the entire jurisdiction or through the entire timeline of the disaster, but they're the ones that are the first people that these disaster survivors or victims are seeing um, during and after a, a disaster. So we wanted to ensure that anything, there may have been confusion, not just sending out a document, a 30 or 40 page document saying, hey, read this. But we wanted to ensure that if people had questions or if people had concerns, um, we would be able to implement those, or at least if people had ideas that we didn't think of during this, we were able to make those changes. And then subsequently in 2021, we issued our second version of the document. I mean, by that time, we had now been in the pandemic for about a year and we knew a lot more about masks, the vaccines. Um, so again, it was not just information, uh, but it was continually learning from all of the lessons from the 2020 fires and then providing updates as well. Thanks. And, and I just want to point out one subtle thing that you said there that, that maybe people need a, just a slight bit of clarification about. But, um, you know, we all have a concept of a shelter and it's in some, you know, gymnasium or wherever kind of place. But you talked about hotel rooms. This was because of COVID, right? Correct, yes, it was in, because of the COVID disaster, yes. Right, so there are other kinds of considerations um, or you have to branch out your thinking as a planner, you know, given, well, at, at the time, given COVID, but maybe in the future, if we're gonna plan for everything, where you have to think about the other kinds of resources that are in your community that might need to be put into play here. And, and in this uh, circumstance, during COVID, um, hotel rooms were actually used a lot um, to house people and shelter them um, uh, during emergencies that occurred unrelated to COVID, but that you couldn't, you didn't really want to put everybody into the same space um, during COVID. So, right? Anything else to add to that, JR? Correct. Um, I would say that's why we also, we we had some discussion about the name of the plan. Originally, we were going to call it the COVID response or COVID guidance for shelter. Um, and we decided, you know, COVID may not be, I mean, hopefully it is, but it may not be the last pandemic um, type thing as we're seeing monkeypox and other things coming up. We wanted to make it generic enough to not just mention COVID because um, we wanted this to be a, a guide that could be for any type of pandemic related issue. Um, and be generic enough that we can add specifics for the different types of um, pandemics that come out like COVID with the six feet, but maybe with the next pandemic, it's eight feet. Um, so it's being sure that we at least created that pandemic plan and then fill in the gaps with CDPH or CDC guidelines um, additionally as things came out. Yeah, lots of lessons learned from the uh, 2020 uh, wildfire response and the COVID, uh, COVID uh, 
non congregate sheltering. Right. And, and again, you know, just sort of the, the continuing need to be creative in the planning um, for different kinds of disasters that you, you know, disaster is mainly a disaster because we don't know what it is before it happens. And so we just have to be a little bit uh, planful about that and also include the planning for people with disabilities on that. And so now I want to turn to Travis because so that was so JR talked about what happens at the state level, but now at the at the city level, at the jurisdiction level, I suspect that the, the scale of the disaster has a lot to do with how you did your planning for shelters on the on that local level. Can you tell us your experience a little bit about that? Uh, certainly. So uh, yeah, it definitely does. And COVID was was obviously unique in the non congregate sheltering, and, and we actually had, you know, an an, an opportunity to do a, a large scale shelter during COVID nineteen for hurricanes Laura and Delta. We had, I think, at one point about ten thousand of our neighbors from Louisiana and North Texas, in a number of jurisdictions, but primarily in Dallas, at, at a few different very very large hotels, which were fortunately available and empty. Uh, at the time, because it was in the middle of COVID, um, and so you know that presented its own unique challenges and and new uh, ways that we had to approach things, um, you know, specific to to not being able to um, address big groups all at once, and I mean all the communication challenges, some of which have already been talked about. Um, but it it also uh, the scale changes a little bit. Going back to an event like Hurricane Harvey where, you know, as opposed to what we would most typically be dealing with in Dallas, you know, a, a localized emergency causing uh, somewhere up to like 200 people, maybe that need uh, shelter for a couple of nights, um, looking at something that very rapidly balloons into uh, several thousand people needing shelter and being evacuated via air. Um, so your, your timing from them leaving where they're at to getting to Dallas was, you know, hours, whereas on a bus or another form of transportation, it's uh, you know, a lot longer. Um, anyways, you know, those those events taught us a, a lot, uh, again, about, I keep talking about our planning assumptions being challenged, but they, they are every time, you know, to, to some degree. And that was definitely one where we felt that we had a whole trailer full of durable medical equipment. We had a lot of resources and people engaged. We, you know, the, an entire kind of clinic was built at the convention center that was really impressive but it, it did it ultimately just came down to um at as the scale grew we quickly realized that our assumptions about how many people might need to go to dialysis how many people might need a CPAP how many people might not be able to be um you know towards the middle of the shelter because it's more difficult to get up and move to the bathrooms all of those things I saw someone earlier in the questions mention about um, you know, how we might accommodate uh, individuals with autism. And, you know, that was something that was new to us. And, and I say new to us, I, I mean, I just, frankly, you know, uh, I don't know that we had really considered that yet. And, and when we were faced with it, we were able to make those adjustments and kind of find a, you know, private areas for folks that needed that accommodation. So, so that worked out there. Um, but it, we, we were, thankful for that experience because it, it taught us that, you know, that's something we need to be expecting and anticipating. And so the next time we do these, um, we, we already come at it from that angle, whether we need to make that accommodation or not, knowing that we can do it and quickly adapt to, to whoever does arrive at the shelter is really important. And uh, I think just the landscape of, of needs that, that we can expect um, are, are a little more straightforward to manage in a, in a local emergency, but uh, do get really wide um, during these these bigger events. And so, um, you know, again, I, I think that it, it those events were really important for, for us in, in planning for the future. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, we're able to continue incorporating all of those lessons learned. Uh, at, at, unfortunately, it's, it's almost a guarantee that we're going to be doing it again, probably sooner rather than later, unfortunately. So. Yeah, and and I also want to make a point about that uh, about that autism point. Um, <clears throat> you know, this this is and, and people just so everyone knows what we're talking about here. Um, you know, there have been a few comments and questions in in the Q and A about you know autism and how you know how shelters are dealing with with those issues. Um, 
you know, and the needs of people with autism being in a, uh, a general, a, a large sheltering area. You know, this is where um, the individuals who represent the people with autism or people with autism themselves being in a group, um, being in the committees that, that help the planners to understand the needs come into play, okay? So, so the needs that you're expressing, the needs that you're questioning right now are the ones that you need to express to people as they do the planning, just like people had to do about service animals or about personal assistance services or whatever the needs are or about you know, the need for refrigeration of insulin. I mean, the, the, the list can go on and on here. And so peop the people who are planning this need to know that and they're gonna get that from your lived experience. So, so do try to get involved in that. And, and with, with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip it back to you know, our um, disability organization representative on this panel, Jim. Um, and Jim, um, in addition to consumer organizations being instrumental in assisting local emergency management offices about these specific and local needs of people with disabilities, you know, at these organizations, your organizations can also play an advocacy role on the larger level, right? And so I understand that your group pushed for a state level um, AFN specialist in Washington. Can you tell us more about that and how you came to that point? Okay, well, first of all, it was a long stra strategic plan um, to get the state government to uh, take that step following our request for an SFN special, an AFN specialist. So we had to partner up with um, including disaster strategies. And uh, we held a conference, a two-day conference. And every workshop started with, why do people with disabilities, wh why do we need to be ready for people with disabilities? Um, who's the partners in the community that can help us figure that out? The Red Cross, various advocacy groups, centers for independent living, deaf centers, various organizations throughout the area. And that could show that and show that we're partnered with them and it takes a village, you know? So then another workshop was talking about how the Department of Health that funds can fund that program and making a list of organizations and emergency management um, details, what whatever they've learned and talking about some state uh, AFN coordinators. Um, so Sally has helped a lot, I really appreciate that. Um, she wrote her white paper, a position paper about why Washington state needs to have its own AFN specialist because CIEP is just a Monday through Friday operation. We're not running 24 seven. So we needed to get more people to help coordinate the services. So we wrote this paper about, uh, and the emergency management division liked it so much that they attached it um, to make a better request to request funding for an AFN specialist. And I'm happy to say that the legislature, the legislators did approve that. We got money plus another full-time position. Um, we have a tribal liaison. And with that, the expectation is that someday we're going to have all these other groups on board also. Um, starting in the fall, we're looking forward to that happening. So we are really growing our, our embassy here. Okay, thanks so much, Jim. Um, and 
So now turning back to Denise, I'm so sorry, Denise, you're the lead off, but then you had to wait for everybody to go all the way through their first answers and now their second answers to come back to you. So, but maybe you can kind of put a, put a bow on this by sort of talking about how, how you think people can think about the steps that can be taken in emergency, like increasing awareness and preparation so that, you know, you, that the shelters just become part of that whole that whole fabric. Yeah, I think Adam, I'm listening to everybody else. They've all been really interesting. Um, and I, let me keep up with the question and answering section. Um, so I think, you know, really at the Red Cross and in the entire emergency management community, what we're looking at is displacement. Right. And the very first, the top line is how can we keep people from being displaced? So in wildfire areas, that could be defensible space. In tornado areas, it could be having a place to go to in case of a tornado. It can be home hardening. It can be any of those things. And I think there's a lot of work that can be done on that front end to prevent the displacement and then preparing people for being displaced. So whatever we can do to make sure, and especially for people with disabilities, we, we, we have a checklist and a training. We're not the only ones. FEMA has one, states have one, counties have one, but really trying to get out to people through whatever methodology we can to really help people start planning now for the displacement. Find a transportation solution. What is your plan for personal care? <clears throat> I told you I was a storyteller. I will tell you in 2020, my town was evacuated and my parents are independently living. My mother has a severe form of depression and she uses a walker. My dad is in his 80s, elderly. He now has Alzheimer's, but they're very fragile. Um, and, and I do this for a living. And when I got over to their house, they hadn't packed. They weren't ready to go. Um, I had booked them a hotel room and I called for a caregiver who couldn't come till the next day. And we loaded everything up in the car and, and it was fast and it was hurried and my dad can still drive and he followed me to the hotel. And I stood in line to get them registered with all the other people that were evacuated. And I looked out and they were sitting on a curb. And I was like, what are they doing? And I went outside and they forgot my mom's walker. And I suddenly had you know, greater insight into our clients and how they show up without their durable medical equipment. So anything we can do, I've seen it in my own life, anything we can do to help people get better prepared for that displacement is the first thing. The second thing is how do we make it better while they are displaced, right? How do we get better supplies? Shelters used to be open for two weeks. During the campfire, Silver Dollar was open for 99 days. So how do we make that displacement better for people and what supplies and whole community, how can we get not just the FAST teams, but some of the other people who have got expertise in some areas to come out and walk the shelters and find out how we can make it better while they're displaced. What can we do to shorten the time of displacement? If, if, you know, if the community services are not back up, People can't go home. So maybe we can look at, at, at that area and say, what can we do to help the whole community recover in order so that people can get home? And then the fourth thing that's really important is what do we do about displacement caused poverty? People across the spectrum are disproportionately affected by disasters. A lot of people that are on the cusp of poverty a disaster is the thing that can that can tip them over into it. So what can we do to really offer better services and more assistance to help people get back home and get back to a better situation? I think that's a whole community. Nobody can do that alone. It's VOADS, it's Centers for Independent Living, it's the Red Cross, it's, it's all of the other NGOs, it's states, it's FEMA. Everybody's looking at our policies going, we know the trajectory we're on, but those displacement factors are really the factors we have to start paying attention. And it comes, it starts with preparedness and planning. Um, back to all the way back to my beginning point. If we don't prepare people for this and we don't work together planning beforehand, we can always run out with a credit card and buy something if their stores open. 
right? We can always source something, but there may be a delay. Anything that we can do beforehand to help people is gonna make all of us stronger. Yeah, thank you. And and I, I do wanna come back to one thing that you talked about, talked about and, and then I want everybody to sort of maybe grok a little bit and I'm gonna make a, a, a generalization here, but I think it's mostly true. Um, and that is, <clears throat> If you need to go, if there's a disaster and somebody needs to go to a shelter, that tends to be people who do not have resources, right? So Denise just told a story about she helped her parents go somewhere because her parents had resources. But the people who don't have resources are the ones who end up in these shelters. And so you're really looking, when you look at poverty and we know <clears throat> from data, how poverty tracks very significantly with disabilities. So the shelters are going to be particularly filled with people who are in poverty and probably have disabilities. So I want you to keep that in mind as if those of you who are out there who are planning for, for, for this as well. Um, so uh, let me, okay, so we're, we're getting near to the end, but I, I wanna go through a, maybe a, a, I don't wanna call it lightning round because I think we have more time than that, but let's, let's do this, okay? Um, each of us, each of, your, each of our panelists here, why don't you tell people in, in your sphere of things, what might be two to three to do's for people in your sphere for, for them to do Monday morning. Two to three to do's for Monday morning. So we're gonna go through just while you're thinking about this, let me explain. So Denise, maybe you can think about it for nonprofits and NGOs, you know, and Travis, you can think about it for local, local emergency management agencies and um, JR to think about it for you know, states, uh, state agencies, and Jim to think about it for people with disabilities or disability organizations, okay? So, um, because I sort of dropped this on you when you guys weren't thinking about it, who, um, <laughs> I won't call on you, I'll let you guys uh, come in first. Who, who wants to come in first? Well, I, I'll just quickly say, I guess, a couple of things that I would recommend doing for, for like the local emergency managers out there is, um, you know, that you can do, I think pretty easily with not a whole lot of research is identifying what are the, what are the organizations that already exist in your community that uh, may tie you into the, the individuals who you might be serving um, in these shelters and, and seeing, you know, how you can reach out to them, how you can open the conversation and start including them in your planning processes. Um, and, you know, we're talking about shelter here, but the, the second thing is really, I think, and we're doing this right now is reviewing every plan, every document to make sure that you're considering that start to finish. And, you know, just, you know doing it for the shelter obviously is incredibly important, um, you know, for ma all mass care stuff, but um, really when you're looking at every other aspect of, of what we do, uh, it, it needs to be a consideration. And if you do that first thing by identifying who in the community can help you with that, uh, which is an ongoing process for us. I know we don't, I know we don't know everybody. I know we have, it's, it's going to be a continual thing. Um, but, but starting that I think is really important for local EMs. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Travis. Who's, who's next? I'll go. So I, I will say that you know, the two things that you can do are reach out to not just the Red Cross, right? Reach out to the community. If you have expertise in this area or you know something that we maybe don't know, I, I believe we're all open to education. You know, the autism stuff that came up is a really great example. I, I heard that we were doing that somewhere and, and I didn't even know we were doing it. I hadn't even really thought about it, right? And I still need to learn more. I need to know what questions to ask, what resources to talk about. So if you have expertise, reach out to that community, that partnership. And if you have a, if you have a place where you can advocate for that preparedness, 
um, be it within your government, be it within your BOAD, be it with your, your legislature, advocating for the planning phase and getting folks ready now for a disaster, especially people who are socially vulnerable and, and, and people with disabilities, that's gotta be a priority and they need to hear it from all of us. We can also be super positive about that message. Um, and, and if we are super positive, and I think this symposium gives us an avenue to be super positive. We had this symposium, we all got together, we're all in agreement, we can make a difference. I think, I think that positivity can help drive change. Great, thank you, Denise. Um, JR? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, I would say one of the, the biggest things that I've learned is building relationships and communication, um, especially after the Caldor fire in California, which pushed evacuees into the state of Nevada. Um, building those relationships ahead of time, instead of trying to learn who your uh, counterparts are or who your uh, other people you would work with in other states or other jurisdictions. Um, so we've actually, after that lesson learned of really wishing that we would have known who to work with in Nevada, we've done that now by reaching out to our other border states and helping build those relationships. That's something that I would think is extremely important. But also um, for us, it's serving the local jurisdictions. That's our main goal is we help when local jurisdictions reach their capacity. But if the local jurisdictions don't know what we do or how we can help, it's that communication part. And uh, that's why we've created those um, quarterly meetings to, to make sure that we provide these updates to the, the counties, the local jurisdictions on who we are, what we do, because I may give a county an update and I feel like they're very aware that there's 58 counties in California, which means there's a lot of turnover year after year. People cycle through these positions. So I may have told one county something two months ago, but two months later, they may not be aware because somebody else is in that position. So making sure that you're building those relationships and keeping up that communication so people know what your capabilities are and what you can do to help provide services during disasters. Great. And Jim would like to add something. Yeah, and Jim, your turn. I do agree with each of you, everyone. But another thing is important to remember is people with disabilities, many of them have cross disabilities. I've seen a lot of groups and organizations and they single out for a specific disability. But people often have multiple disabilities. And so it's hard to have just a specific checklist of, of each area you serve. I think we need to have um, a, an inclusive service for people with multiple disabilities. I've experienced it myself. And I, as a deaf person, it's not enough. I can't do it all my, on my own. I need to partner with other people with disabilities, disabilities like myself uh, to get this work going. Also is emergency uh, management. Within that realm, we need to develop and within their own community, we need to develop um, the resources for AFN and have a list of those resources and check with the Centers for Independent Living and other dis disabled services organizations and advocacy organizations as well. And really start to make those connections now while we're not experiencing disaster or hardship. We we need to do those relationships and, and foster those relationships now and not during the middle of a crisis. Yeah, great, thank you, Jim. And, and I think that all of you are really saying sort of something similar. Um, and you're all sort of saying it's, it's time to really be working together. It's time to be connecting to, you know, eight organizations that represent people with disabilities. It's time to be looking at, um, partner organizations, partner states, partner regions, to be able to think about this in, in a more expansive way. Uh, I would like to add a couple of, couple of things um, to, to that and um, to sort of wrap this up. Um, one thing that was not really brought up today, but was 
briefly mentioned and is kind of close to my heart there. We've done some research here at our center that looked at the, un, the, the uh, understanding of emergency managers about the ADA and about their responsibilities and especially in sheltering. And a lot of it has to do, this is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very tricky that you have an extraordinarily difficult job. You have so many things to think about. And here is this other thing that maybe is new for you. You know, I think that this is one where many people might feel, and it sounds like from our research, are feeling a little overwhelmed to try to have to deal with all of a sudden, or not really all of a sudden, but in their view, all of a sudden. But there are resources. There are resources that are available. As Denise said, there's resources at FEMA. There's resources probably in your state. There's resources maybe at your locality. And in your locality, there is a resource that should be there called an ADA coordinator. Um, and you should be thinking about working with the, that person because they are the ones who's, who is supposed to be responsible for understanding about the uh, making the services and programs of the jurisdiction um, accessible for people with disabilities. And the, and the shelter would be uh, a program or service of that jurisdiction. So think about in, in connecting with your ADA coordinators as well. All right, I wanna thank all of you so much. Thank you to Jim and JR and Travis, Denise, fantastic information that you guys gave. Um, thank you all for listening for through this. Um, hopefully you learned something, found something that was useful, have a couple of to-dos to go back on Monday morning to uh, deal with. And uh, um, thank you again to Vance and the AFN Symposium coordinators for uh, putting together this panel and allowing me to be part of it.